Hey, thanks for joining us for another episode of The Residence Podcast, a space where we let the community from the Pervasive Media Studio share a bit about themselves and what the space is really like. In today's episode, I have the pleasure of listening to Verity McIntosh and Laura Kreefman, two people who have moved away from the Pervasive Media Studio, but have left an indelible mark on the space nonetheless. There was so much to cover in such a rich conversation. Laura and Verity shared so much wisdom from their time directly in the studio and the impact it has had on the work they've gone on to do. I hope there's something in there for you. Hey, uh, and welcome to The Residence Podcast. I'm your host, Will Taylor, and I am joined today by none other than Verity McIntosh and Laura Kreefman to, for me personally, highly esteemed, can I call you alumni? I don't know. Are you like, are you like Avengers now doing your stuff out in the <laughs> wide world? Oh my God, yes. Eternals. Yes, We're eternals, Laura. <laughs> We're eternals. We're always here. Yes. We'll always I, be here. <laughs> I love that. That's, that is so, it's so amazing to hear you put it that way, man, because like in, in a bit of a B-roll, like before recording, that's exactly what I was saying, you know, because every time I sort of walk into that space, I'm reminded I've got fond memories of both of you, you know what I'm saying? Like doing whatever it is you were doing as like as your work shifted and changed over the period of time, over that course of time. But so I mean like I could fanboy for ages, but I'd love to pass the mic over and let you introduce yourselves. So I'm Laura Kreefman. Uh uh, we had a really interesting debate figuring out how long I've been involved in the PM studio. I think I joined in 2011 as one of the sound artists uh, residencies. And I feel really honoured to be asked to be on this today because I feel like I'm accidentally quite far away from my uh, home and this community who I love. And so it's great to know that I'm welcome. Uh, I am. I just make lots of stuff. I have a habit of trying to do impossible projects or ludicrous ideas. I like big spectacles. I like stuff that fuse um, music and movement and technology. I have a habit of changing direction quite often and (laughs) doing too much. And I um, am currently living five minutes from the sea, as well as running my company that has been very quiet for a while. Uh, as we all understand, I am the CEO at the Barbican Theatre in Plymouth. So I have been, <laughs> I've been revolutionising the theatre in Plymouth <laughs> and causing havoc. And actually, it's surprisingly good fun. Um, so yeah, so I'm causing havoc in Plymouth and trying to look at how I can instill all the extraordinary things I've learned from the PM studio and the community and ways of working and different ways of approaching stuff and breaking the rule book. It's quite fun. So that's me kind of in a nutshell, maybe. I don't know. I'm Verity McIntosh. Uh, So yeah, my route into the studio was a bit convoluted. Like I guess most people's, I was actually working at Watershed in kind of 2007, 2008 like deputy front of house manager so I was looking after the box office and the ushers and the public and this was the time that the studio was just kind of getting started in the old space and I just had distant love and admiration and confusion and discombobulation for what it was I kind of went to talks and like hung out in the bar with people but I didn't really have a like a foot in and then in I'm going to just share stuff that I don't normally, but this feels like the place. Um, In 2010, I applied to do uh, a job there, which would have been the producer of something called Theatre Sandbox, which was this amazing kind of development scheme for theatre practitioners who wanted to kind of embrace technology in some way. So I applied for that job and didn't get an interview, like not even a bit. It was just the (laughs) the wrong thing. I was entirely unqualified and I didn't know what I was doing, but I thought like, oh, just go for it. Sounds amazing. Um, and I was a bit embarrassed to not even get an interview because I worked there and I knew some other people. But I was, um, for me, pretty brave and asked the person who I'd applied to for like a debrief. Uh, and that was Claire Reddington, who's now CEO of Watershed. And she was very generous and like bought me a drink and sat me down and got me to like map out what do I want to do? What do I know? What don't I know? Mm-hmm. And she looked at my what don't I know column and said, I can help you with this. Um, and she gave me like a mini like internship job doing the blog 
for Theatre Sandbox, which I feel like would now be a podcast. So I feel like I'm 100% full circle on this. Um, so I kind of like did this voluntary position, like getting the participants to write blogs and then trying to make their blogs into one super blog that we would then share. This makes me feel really old, but that's what that's what happened. Um, and that internship almost certainly got me another job somewhere else which got me loads more experience doing funding and uh, development stuff and working with companies and all kinds of things that turned out to be really helpful. So that when the opportunity rolled around again in 2011 to apply for a producer job at the studio, which was the kind of to be the producer of the studio, I was just in so much of a happier, better place to be able to take that on. And I went for it and I was lucky enough to get it. Um, I actually didn't think I was going to get that. I knew there were other jobs coming up and I figured if I interviewed for this one, they'd at least know that I was keen. So I was quite surprised to get that job. Um, but yeah, from 2011, I then became a member of the of the team and the community and um, was able to to work with the extraordinary community of residents, including both of your wonderful selves. Uh, I was there for about seven years, um, developing all kinds of different programs and activities and running residencies and um, basically kind of just being part of the furniture and trying to live that generous and interruptible mantra that um some of your listeners will know already which is so like important the way the studio runs um i would kind of be the the flagship for interruptible by just interrupting everyone and being interrupted all the time and that was about seven years of my life and i loved it um and then in 2018 so about three years ago now um i got the opportunity to kind of transfer some of that stuff that i've been doing and learning within watersheds and the studio um, into academia, where I now run a master's program in virtual and extended reality, which is a discipline I kind of got into during my life in the studio and discovered a passion that I wouldn't have otherwise discovered and a, mostly a passion for trying to make accessible pathways for people to engage with this really inaccessible technology and try to find ways to get new voices into the mix. Um, so that's what I do now. I do research and teaching and still some creative producing stuff kind of on the side, on the sneaky um, but yeah, my focus these days is, is kind of particular to this like immersive storytelling space. Absolutely amazing. It's so great to sort of hear your histories, I guess, you know, like your personal experiences of moving into, moving around and moving away from the PM studio, mm. actually get this sort of real holistic, like cyclical feel from it and that it feels like I don't know I may just be presuming here but a place for you both that you can sort of tap into and then take your learnings or experiences elsewhere yeah there was a moment I don't think I would have had the confidence to move to a town where I knew n nobody if I hadn't actually had the community because actually I'd started to tour quite extensively so I was kind of like ending up on all these adventures for up to six months of the year in these really little episodic opportunities and I was doing stuff which was really embedding what I believed in and what the community believed in and loads of other places around the world and around the country and then I got to a point where I realized that my community was with me so that had taken me quite a long time to build the confidence and trust that I really believed in this completely different way of working and having that regular contact of almost being in the studio every day to reaffirm that when you were hitting brick walls out externally and being able to turn around to somebody else and go, am I off my rocker that I think there's a different way we can do this? And they go, no, no, hold your ground. And you go, oh, okay, great. How do I write that in that email? And they're like, oh, okay, let's, let's figure this out together. Um, and it was as I started to travel more and I realized that I had, that had become so much part of my process and my foundations. And therefore my, I felt like my community was with me that I felt I had the confidence to actually do that without necessarily having to be located permanently in the building or be a, like be beyond the ground there in that community on, on a daily level. But that felt like quite a big shift to suddenly go, oh, I'm just going to move to go here. OK, it's OK. <laughs> and, uh, uh, um, but it was a it was that iteration. And that's what I get really excited about seeing with some of the studio residents is that uh, people realizing and myself realizing that there is this way of working this way of being is really core and really important and when it becomes embedded in your work you realize you don't need to be in the building all the time but that doesn't mean that you're not part of that family that world and that you can instill the same like I'm watching the same principles land elsewhere 
you know, and feeling yeah. that change land elsewhere mm. and kind of going, and I'm like, oh, oh. Uh, it feels a good thing. It feels a good thing. Yeah, no, I, I hear you on that one. I think, um, I think one thing that having a bit of perspective from it, you know, having been outside of the studio, at least on an everyday basis for a period of time now, is like how much, and I feel like we knew this at the time, but it's so good to see it in in the world. Like it's not really about the things that people are doing or the projects or the like talks or the outcomes or any of that nonsense. Um, the values is the stuff that you find is so striking. And uh, not least when, you know, when it, it just isn't as much of a daily practice or a daily conversation elsewhere, you know, there's, there's some really mm -hmm. like fantastic people that you can encounter out in the world. But this, this idea that like a really large community of like over a hundred people can create this sort of permissive space to challenge everything <laughs> like for that to be good not to be a problem you know like this challenge mentality that you can say actually like yeah. I don't think it has to be that way or can you just get eyes on this because I think someone's you know taking advantage of me or or like making an assumption here or is like diminishing someone else like that's a conversation that's mm -hmm. so easy to have in the studio because there's this sort of common understanding that that's not okay and that there's a there's a response to that and that there's a collective response to that if we can just kind of build each other up and strengthen each other like that I don't think I've really felt in the same way ever else in my life and I, I hope like you were saying that that part of our job as sort of more at reach humans now is that we sort of continue to demand that or, or like allow for that conversation to happen elsewhere there's two tiny little things which I think we miss about this which is that um having worked in loads of other co-working spaces in the country mm. and all that kind of malarkey, right? Almost all of them, you only have a right to be there if you have proved your mm. worth, right? The PM studio, <laughs> myself included, came in with a question. Like I was in a completely different field and I went, I can't do something. I've got a question about it. Can I come and have a look at this question? We come in from in a place of unknowing and that permission to be unknowing is, is extraordinary because that's a really vulnerable place for people's egos, let's be honest. And when we're working professionally, because you are known for the niche that you fall into. Um, so that permission to keep widening yourself and to become uh, less blinkered. But also then actually, because there's so many people from so many different fields, nobody is an expert in the direction of travel that you're going in. So the conversations you have, have a real openness as, as critical friends. They're like, I don't know anything about tap dance, but there was an image here that reminded me of this. And there was something in the music that made me think of this. And I was wondering whether or not you've tried this tool and you should relax, it's just bloody awesome. You know, or whatever it is that somebody's brain stable. There is a fundamental belief that everyone in that space has value and worth. And to me, that's the thing that's missing in almost any other space. There is always a presumption you only have worth or value when you have critical acclaim or all this other stuff. Not that your idea or your questioning or what you just as a person bring to the table has value and worth. And that's why I invested in that community. That's why I invest in it is even at that fundamental level. And then that does make it easier to have those bigger questions. Like there is no way in hell's bells I would have been able to pull off cranes without the wider PM studio and watershed world. Because mm -hmm. I'm going, I started that as a team of one and then there were three of us and right in the final week there were 90 people and <laughs> there was a threatened lawsuit <laughs> and lots of other things in the background. But it meant that I was able to go to people and sit down and go, this is my instinct. I think from X, Y, and Z, what have I forgotten? What am I missing? What do I also need to consider? And there was permission to do that. To when you're doing big and dangerous stuff, big and dangerous, but you know, when you're, it's not necessarily big and dangerous, but when you're doing stuff that is different with outside partners and you have to communicate to them with confidence and surety and in their language and create trust and take them on a journey with you, having a space that you can come away from that call and go, cool, I just said this was possible. <laughs> did I get that right? Oh yes, I did. Oh great, cool. Anyone know who can help me do it? Okay, great that, okay, great. Um, that's that's worth its weight in gold where that doesn't, then, then that's not held against you, you know? 
And to me, that that all that's really what feeds into that space. And I feel like that's what I'm desperate and I'm working really hard to feed into my collaborators and the spaces that I'm in now. I guess part of what we're talking about today is like, what what's it like on the other side? And one of the, th- you know, I get a lot of people reflecting the PM studio back to me, whether they've been involved or not. And I guess one thing I do hear sometimes, I don't think you hear on the inside very much, um, is like, isn't it quite elitist though or quite exclusive like you know you're talking about this wonderfully like permissive welcoming come with your weird ideas you don't need to know shit um, stuff things um but (laughs) but but I still feel like that's not maybe people don't believe that that's true and maybe sometimes it's not true and I think you know it's so different to a lot of other open calls that will go out where they'll be like hey come with your questions no ideas or bad ideas and then you put an application in there like yeah but like, can you actually do it? And what is it exactly? So I think there's a there's a challenge there about like, how do you make that invitation real and feel real? Um, is it real? And also, I guess, one of the things that was bugging me towards the end that I still don't feel like I've got any like tethers to, so I'd love to hear what you both think, is like, who feels confident or like, empowered to put that forward? Like, you know, I'm I'm kind of, coming a lot of people that will come forward come so you know have a lot of confidence or a lot of like experience or like have been kind of given nothing but um advantage their whole life so like of course i can come forward with basically a piece of string and a a good idea and like they'll accept that because i'm you know why wouldn't they um whereas i think for, for a lot of people they haven't had a life like that and so does that mean they're not going to come forward even if the invitation might feel really permissive I I was sort of starting to really struggle with that a bit towards the end like how how do we keep that openness without it almost like cutting a bunch of people out who don't feel like they can answer that call I think I think will you'd agree with me I think the I think the organization heard that and felt that for themselves and I feel like the work they were doing with Zara and also the work they're doing now with the way that they're framing. I mean, I am borrowing all of the watershed's best practice with full <laughs> like hands up. I am so in, so impressed with what they've done on this in the last couple of years about actually how you change your language of applications, how you yeah. how you give other examples. You may never work in the culture sector, but you might have this transferable skill or this transferable skill yeah. or this transferable skill. The the specificity of the anyone they're trying to reach so that openness and that identifiability and changing where you put stuff and I feel like I I felt from seeing it from the inside that a lot of that learning and change came from the work Zara was doing Mm. and Claire was open to and everyone was open to within the the PM studio and then it kept and with Rife and everything and then it kept permeating and permeating into the organization um and I feel like those I, I the last few years have felt different different mm-hmm. and I was relieved to see that change I'm with you on that but mm-hmm. I don't know what you think Will do you know what man first of all like, it's just I'm highly blessed right now to be able to listen to you both speak about your perspective in the studio because I'm I'm getting two things from what you've both spoken about today I'm getting something about risk and risk averseness And something about leadership, actually, and disruptive leadership, innovative leadership, like non-traditional leadership, and how a place like the PM Studio can help foster that. Because when you start to critically look at leadership and you understand the sort of, I guess, phenomenology of it all, like what it feels like, the experience of leadership, you know, the, the vulnerability that comes with it, the perpetual seeking of justice I guess and I'm speaking specifically coming from like the angle that we're approaching this work from it it, it means that there are several fronts you're battling on you know Mm -hmm. and some that you just might not be well rehearsed in you know so then it's like part of leadership is leaning trying to understand yourself enough to be clear on what you the type of support you need Mm -hmm. and and having the sort of like discernment to be able to like identify who has the minerals to be able to support you in the way that you need as well. Like you were saying in that, there's how people view risk in that process. 
for example, like I'm I'm confident in public speaking. Like I'm confident in being a sort of like representative of different communities. And that comes from my background, you know, having to code switch all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm still really risk averse in certain areas because of the way I grew up, the stakes were always so high. So so in the time I've been at the PM studio, it's been around trying to learn that like you can you can build a relationship with risk and then use that to empower yourself to do the things you've both been saying like take something you've learned and transfer it into a new context you've got to believe in that do you know what i'm mm-hmm. saying because you've the type of work we're doing now there isn't actually a reference point in history for what we're trying to achieve and so much of leadership so much of like traditional practice requires and relies so heavily on those reference points in the past i don't know i'm not i'm not a historian but i doubt anyone's ever had to deal with a pandemic in an internet age before like that and that's huge you know what i'm saying so i just think to sort of like reflect that back at you both in terms of what you've taken from effectively like building your relationship with risk through your experience in the pm studio and and how that's affecting the work you're doing now Mm. I wouldn't be doing any of the work I'm doing if I hadn't been in the PM studio. Mm. Or, no, actually, I think that's probably true. I was almost going to counter that, but I don't think, I don't think I would have. I would have been doing some risky stuff. I would have been delivering on some elements of it, but I would have given up on a lot of the stuff, which is the braver, harder stuff that actually now is the stuff that I feel most excited by and people are most interested in. And I think I would have been in quite a staid world. And um, and I don't think I would have had the confidence to break out of those railroads. There's a lot of railroads that we're all on and that we, we're all placed on. And it's that they they can be quite hard to step off or turn around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how about you, Verity? I feel a bit like um, like a fraud talking about risk because I think um, <laughs> I, you're not well, a fraud. I, but in one very specific way, I've I've never um, felt able to take the risk that most of the residents do, and that's to not have a steady salary job. Like um, I think you know my kind of family background presumes that that's what you need and you know uh saying that i mean like uh, my dad is now like an outrageous independent freelance artist guy but and and always pretty much has been in in different ways but i think um there are lots of wonderful role models in my family who have kind of taught me to make sure that you can you know you've got your bills paid and that you know like how you're going to get from this month to next month and I've never I've never like been able to be brave enough to like shake that off and go forget it I'm freelance now and and I'm going to risk these these massive ideas and I think for me like I have this level of safety that I've always needed and then from that position hopefully that gives me the like stability to enable all of these extraordinary humans that I've had the outrageous fortune to work with over the last a million years um to kind of give them like a, a relatively stable human in the mix who can kind of go after the money and to and to like build the partnerships and to make the introductions and to try and do some of that kind of um, stable person work, I guess, <laughs> that that kind of salary gives me. I get, you know, I, I'm always chasing things for yeah. other people because I think like that's the position that I can hold from here. Um, and I, I, yeah, I really admire the work that you guys do and so many do when, and there is so much risk involved in in these big kind of bets that you have to make on yourself to be able to to work in this way it's i'm i'm sort of in awe of it and a little scared of it too it's you know it's a lot and i really recognize the amount of risk that people take on to d- to do this you know whether it's like deciding to spend a year of their life doing a master's course that they're going to have to pay money for instead of like earning money for that's a massive punt and a massive investment that you know, cannot be underestimated and you have to really like respect that risk that people are taking on you know on themselves and make the most of that time and it's 
it's like that to a thousand percent in the studio everybody mm. is there at their most like precarious moment saying i think there's something here but i don't know now and and i think part of what the studio community does is it doesn't like patronize that it acknowledges that risk and and rallies around it and there's some wonderful producers there like now and mm. always who will try and like take some of that risk on from that privileged position of a salaried role to be able to say i'm going to hold this for you and with you and and shout at everybody and tell them how great you are that's but that was what yeah, was so great about the game studio was the was was the, the fact that there were embedded producers and there was an embedded commitment from the pervasive media studio and the watershed that uh, part of their role is to advocate and and i think this is part of claire's wisdom is like knowing that you have to have you have to be there to advocate and to straight talkingly and to larger stakeholders tell those stories and tell those narratives. And that's why I was always happy to be what we jokingly in the studio was like, you know, the dancing monkey, the point where somebody's coming around, you're like, here, let me stand up and give you a three 30 second pitch. Cool. Great. You're going on. <laughs> and they may never talk to you again, but I always thought that was part of my, my return. Like I'm was always happy to do that. Um, but that was but what was great is all the residencies, all the R and Ds, all the hack days, everything was paid. Mm-hmm. So even if they weren't there was there was, you know, some things had fifty grand attached to them, some things had two hundred and fifty quid attached to them. Mm-hmm. But that is um that has always been the case. And to me, that's that was always phenomenal, which was that respect for what we would all be bringing to this, the table. mate the passion for their work was front and center in that chat but it also went so much further than that i've only known verity and laura to be incredibly supportive of whoever they come across so hearing how their histories have shaped their approach to life and how that influences their ability to show up for others is really humbling next up we've got the moral quandary section our little game where we explore the little cheeky monkey in us all waiting to be called into the limelight. So the way this works is we've got four topics for our guests to choose from. They'll read out a question from the topic of choice and offer their answer. The group can deliberate or offer their own answers too. We've also added a wild card to this series so they can answer a question not immediately related to the topics we provided. There are no right or wrong answers, or winners or losers, just masters of mayhem. So hit us up on social media to share some of your responses to the questions asked. Jump back in with Laura about to tackle a question from the wildcard category. Oh my God, this is amazing. (laughs) The aliens have landed and you now have to choose one of our guests to lip sync a song to show them that we want peace and not war. Who do you pick and what song would you give them? (laughs) Uh, So one of our guests as in one of us three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll put my put my name in the hat as well. Okay, great. Well, because I just put your name in the hat. <laughs> <laughs> so your name's in the hat right now. <laughs> okay, who would do? <sighs> oh, this is this is a this is an interesting one because uh, uh, so actually, I I because I think I no I'm going for this. I think I'd like Will to do the lip sync and I'd very much like Verity and I to do the interpretive dance um <laughs> uh, uh, uh yes. expressionist uh communication to run alongside it. I feel like this is uh true collaboration and uh and we will also back with the um backing vocals. And oh. so, you know, this is a you know. 
Uh, this is this is this is the vision, I believe. And what song? Uh, oh, now this is where I get really stumped in life because I know how songs make me feel, and then I'm really terrible at remembering the names of them and who they're by. <laughs> Uh, this is like the, this is like this is like my downfall which is somebody who does a lot of stuff with music and music uh, <laughs> it's a really really bad habit it's a big responsibility trying to like set the set the tone for humanity that's a big question well yeah i know yeah. I, I know <laughs> through, yeah, through song I, and I, dance yeah um can i ask a, a favor yeah far away amazing can I let that sit in my brain whilst you guys, you know, dance and lip sync in it? And then I will try my darndest to promise <laughs> to give you a song. Can I let that one settle for a tiny bit? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. For this you. is dope. Okay. It's, taken, it's taken on a whole new shape and I'm a big fan. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks. Awesome. So I guess I guess we'll, we'll move over to Verity if you'd like to choose a topic. Okay. I mean... I want them all. Uh, I'm going to go technology, please, Will. Tech. I feel like you're choosing a hard one. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. Okay. So my question is, would you rather live in virtual reality where you are all powerful or live in the real world and be able to go anywhere but not be able to interact with anyone or anything? What? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. So would you rather live in virtual reality where you're all powerful or live in the real world and be able to go anywhere but not be able to interact with anyone or anything? So you're saying, like, would I rather be in the Matrix or be Patrick Swayze in the film Ghost? Is that what I'm hearing here? <laughs> yes. <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. At least, like, Patrick Swayze figured out a way to push stuff. Um, and then, like, <laughs> occupy Whoopi Goldberg in a really weird way. Okay. Um, so... <laughs> Oh, Jesus. I mean, this does slightly raise the question, are we already in virtual reality and we're just like in a really good simulation? But that's that's kind of madness over there. So we won't go we won't go down that horror path. <laughs> um I despite my job and my passion for virtual reality, I will always pick the real world. I, even if I can't touch it, taste it, talk to it, lick it. Like I'm 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 always gonna be here because I think this is this is where the humans are. And I think we're getting better at finding ways to be human in virtual spaces and to kind of think about who we are when we connect like through computers. But the the kind of the authentic experience is always like where I keep my fleshy meat bag and I'm, I'm going to stay with it as long as I can. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to just let go of my, um, <laughs> my ability to like influence the world and just like let that let that drift and be a kind of haunting influence in the world instead i feel like i can i can kind of poltergeist it up somehow if i just try hard enough so i'm gonna i'm gonna stay here if that's all right with you i think there's another bit in there that i just avoided as well which because it's just not it's not right this idea that if you if I was in virtual reality, I'd be all powerful. Like that sounds horrific. <laughs> like, I do not need power. That would be a bad, a bad play for me. I would, uh, yeah, I would probably find like a funny little cave in virtual reality so I didn't get it wrong. I, yeah, I like, um, yeah, I like soft power or no power, but all powerful sounds horrific. I think I would, yeah, I'd become a bad guy in no time at all. That's that's what happens to all heroes, right? <laughs> <laughs> with with great power comes great art holiness and so with no power is great <laughs> I, I choose i choose um i don't know what i choose but i don't choose all powerfulness that sounds that sounds like a bad a bad play yeah i feel you i feel you i think i have an answer but i think it's possibly like um like really twee but i think i'm going with it so on the, the lip sync song i automatically went like oh my god which trout song and, da, 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 and you know classic lip sync moment and then my brain just went actually uh oh this is so cheesy i'm sorry but i'm going <laughs> if we're doing endless love we're doing it <laughs> no <laughs> it's so sim it's so the opposite end of the scale um which is that i think it has to be almost that you you have to find 
Oh, this is so cheesy. You have to make a shared heartbeat with the alien, either yeah. by going for a walk or with them, or like a shared rhythm. And then it's the the lullaby or the hint of a song or the memory of the song that goes with that. Do you ever get that when you're walking somewhere and um or going somewhere or with someone and there's just a resonance of something that comes to the surface? Mm. And and the reason I was thinking of the lullaby in the sense of it's that because they are peace songs. Mm-hmm. I I mean I might leave the room right now because that's a level of schmaltz that I wasn't anticipating. <laughs> I can interpret it down to that. that. That's no problem. <laughs> Yo, that that's fire, man. Because like you never think of how you initiate that lip sync process, you know. But there's something so beautiful about the conversation around the event and allowing the event to become a memory and then a, like sort of attaching some sort of sonic to that memory. It's like starting with, I see you. Mm-hmm. It's like you, th- that's where it's starting from in my head or I need it to start from. Uh, amazing, amazing. So I, I guess, yeah, we're back with Laura. Ooh. How do you feel? Is it is it tech, economy, culture, education? Ooh, uh, it could be any of them. And I am going to, I'm going to say economy. I'm going to punt on economy. Okay. So, the year is 2028 and everything is crypto. It's having a devastating effect on the environment. Yeah, no shit. (laughs) Uh, You have the key (laughs) to crash all cryptocurrency, preventing a natural disaster of epic proportions. But it plunges the world into decades of financial recession. Do you do it? Yes, yes, oh, and actually, yeah. um, I I uh, I choose yes because in my head I just went through what that could be and whether or not that was actually about removing like electrical power or whether or not there was something that was going to actually put us in a danger in like in a in a position that could put lots and lots of people at risk. But actually, what you're talking about there is a thing that does put lots of people at risk in a different way. And there's other power structures in there and other things that I'm now un- unraveling in my brain. But actually. It's our human impact that is causing the planetary crisis that we're in. Mm. And we point blank know that we are running out of time. And I point blank know the stories of people who are Bitcoin multimillionaires and where people are Bitcoin mining on, you know, islands in the Nordic archipelago. So it's cold enough outside and they're producing central heating for everyone on the island. And it's just like, so that everything's being naturally cooled. But you kind of, there's there's a lot to unpack there, even in those statements of supposedly mm-hmm. doing good. And I, I don't think I'm here for it either because I think it's a hype cycle with how crypto works. Mm-hmm. It's funny though, yeah. isn't it? Because the whole, the, the sort of the reason that all the, enthusiasts dove on the idea of cryptocurrency to start with not all i mean some people are as you say just laundering money but like there's a there's a very attractive narrative around it that it is decentralized that there's no one government Mm. there's no one bank there's no one system that Mm -hmm. that gets to um control the world economy the idea of sort of crypto is this more like egalitarian utopia has just been really attractive to a lot of people so you know if you shut it down does it just leave the door wide open for old capitalism to sort of fall back in again and the mint gets minted and the cats get fat? Mm-hmm. You know, what's what's to stop the regression there that, that is just as, probably not just as, but is certainly um, tied to lots of issues around environmental collapse as well? How do you replace it with yeah. something better or, or what do you... Exactly, is exactly that. And that's the tricky thing and that's what we saw with the... Um... The removal of all the currency in India, which I was watching play out literally whilst I was there wow. and with all of my friends and those who were in the know, who were in the know and were told about it and changed mm-hmm. all of their cash beforehand <laughs> and those who didn't, you know, and who didn't know about it. And and I, but I think the key thing that I'm holding into that one is the devastating effect on the environment and that date of 2028. Like if we're still heading in that direction with the ecologic and planetary crisis that we are it's got to be now 
marketing yeah. towards because people's selfishness there has to be a piece of direct action but what i would desperately be wanting to do is figure out how how that doesn't create that power abyss or that abuse of people and abuse of power you know mm-hmm. in it because that's 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 where things go wrong some food for thought there actually to really critically look at what renewal actually means um awesome okay verity would you would you like to pick another topic sure hit me with a wild card okay there you go okay the world is in the throes of a battle with a billionaire supervillain. you have been instructed by the resistance probably laura to put poison on a dessert of your choice what dessert do you pick and why (laughs) 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 so okay so we're in like an epic uh showdown with a billionaire supervillain and the resistance wants me to poison a dessert of my choice, but which dessert do I pick? That's exactly the right question in this conundrum. I love it. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. I mean, like partly like my pragmatist brain wants to know what desserts the supervillain eats. I mean, I guess yeah. partly if I were to look at the question, it's not telling me that I'm going to poison the supervillain. So the world is in the throes of a battle with a billionaire supervillain, comma, You've been instructed by the resistance to put poison in a dessert of your choice. These two things could be unrelated. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to, firstly, I'm going to question the resistance to make sure I know what the intentions are for this <laughs> dessert, right? <laughs> I don't want to be accidentally poisoning something or someone that I was unaware of that I was poisoning. Like if I'm, I'm immediately accepting my role as the poisoner. That seems right. Um, <laughs> no questions there. But like, who am I poisoning? What kind of desserts are they into? Like, will the poison taste of something? Can I hide it in the cream? What are, what are the, yeah, what are the pragmatic things I need to get the hang of if I'm going to be a successful assassin, which I'm taking on board as my job? Um, God, okay. I mean, so, I mean, the, the, the obvious good place to hide a poison would be in something like an ice cream sundae because you've got all those different flavors and you're kind of anticipating different things in each spoonful. So you might not immediately go, ah, that's kind of poisony. But... <laughs> there is risk there because if you don't like one bit of the ice cream sundae if you're not really into the crushed nuts or something and that's where i put my poison what's gonna happen like i'm gonna i'm gonna miss the window there um so i might have to think about getting my poison through the whole shebang <laughs> which involves quite a lot of production like i've got to get into the brownies i've got to get into the ice cream and the crushed nuts and the cream what am I going to do with the chocolate sauce? Can you even get there? Can you could get poison in a chocolate sauce? I'm going to work on this. I will just workshop this up. Sprinkles, sprinkle. I feel like sprinkles are too easy. Like let's not even put poison in the sprinkles. Sprinkles can be just for fun. Um, yeah, I reckon we can we can make this work. But what happens? What happens if they share it though? That's the problem. Some days are really good for sharing. If I ask for two spoons, what am I going to do? Mm. I, I might just have. I hadn't thought yeah. that far ahead. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining the epic super, the, the, the um, I mean, the, the fact of being a billionaire shouldn't automatically make you a super villain, but super villain, but I'm imagining it gives this particular super villain a lot of resources. So, yeah, they probably won't be that generous as to share their, their dessert. They'll just get two. Maybe. It's a risk. It's a real risk here. We're going to have to be careful. Uh, and then I guess, like, yeah, do I need to make sure that I'm the, like, is this going to be one of those James Bond things where I have to, like, disguise myself as a, as a waiter but still look very much like myself and for some reason they don't notice? Or do I need, like, a decent disguise? Do I get someone else to do it? I don't think I should get someone else to do it. I feel like this is, you know, if you're going to if you're gonna be the assassin, you've got to take it on yourself. Otherwise, that's, that's not really yeah. fair to do that to someone else. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to have to bake a lot. <laughs> I'm going to have to learn how to make ice cream. Um, I'm going to have to obviously get like into a lot of um, information about what poisons taste like chocolate fudge so that I can stash it. Um, and then I guess we're going to need someone else from the resistance to give me some useful information about how to like dispose of a body. So, so I've got work to do. I hear you. I, I, I will clear my calendar. Um, we'll, we'll figure this out. Uh, but yeah, don't worry. The resistance is, is secure. We, 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 we're we're going to make this work. Do you know what? I actually just got a little bit hungry. Man. I, I'd, I'd be, don't eat from me, I'd man. I'm a... practicing. Yeah. Take off. I'll be That's doing my rehearsal it. ones. Don't don't taste the food I'm trying. I'd be like the the perfect billionaire supervillain <laughs> to, to receive 
to receive these desserts because I'd just be like, oh, a bit of that, like <laughs> a bit of cake, a bit of ice cream, some brownies, some cookies. I don't know, all of it. You only live once, I guess. <laughs> uh, Depends on how many of my Sundays you eat. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, just pick up the sprinkles. Yeah. <laughs> So for anyone, anyone attending any of Very East dinner parties, yeah, just pick off the sprinkles. That's the lesson. Yeah. From, that's, that's the key takeaway from today's <laughs> podcast is just, yeah, beware the sprinkles. <laughs> Once again, the residents from the PM studio put in their energies together to take on life's challenging questions and not shying away from the themes they bring up either. That conversation was so rich and insightful. If you find yourself in Plymouth, be sure to check out the Barbican Theatre. And for those in and around Bristol, look out for one of Verity's latest ventures with the Interaction Design Association. Their reflections on the camaraderie they've gained from being a resident has me thinking of the countless people who are working to make a difference, not only in their products, but through their processes too. As ever, come through and learn more about the PM Studio at a lunchtime talk every Friday at 1pm. And as always, a massive thanks to The Watershed, the University of Bristol and the University of the West of England for supporting the project. To the PM Studio exec team, I appreciate your patience. I want to take a moment to show some love to Joe Kimber as well. They were instrumental in us being able to get a second series off the ground. Much love, Joe. Our beautiful artwork was created by Jazz Thompson and the music designed by Joe Hill. Remember to check us out on social media to share some of your responses and tune in next time as we get to speak to some more of our beautiful community. <laughs>